Okay, Song of Solomon, chapter 5. Uh, these chapters are, are kind of short, 13 verses or so. So we will get through them rather quickly and get done with this book. But I want to spend a little time uh, talking a little bit more about the whole book. And I know I did last week in the introduction, but some things that I just wanted to share uh, with you also. Depending on your translation, you might you might notice that the translation, like in my New King James, it will start off with the beloved and it kind of outlines for you who's speaking in that area. That is not a part of the scriptures. That's something that, that they put into the Bible. And so just to try to help you clarify who's speaking at that moment. So when it says the beloved or the Shulamite or uh, the friends of the daughters of Jerusalem, you know, it's, it's just clarifying for us who's speaking at that moment. In fact, if you were to really study it, you'll find that they may miss it a little bit. It might be a, another verse or a half a verse that, that all of a sudden it changes from one person to another. So that is not scripture. Just as you know that the verses itself, you know, the 1 through 13 are not scripture. They put those in there so that we can reference the scriptures quickly when we're reading the Bible or going back to reference it for one point or another. Um, also, we um, as, as we go through this, Allegorically, we we know, and I'm not the one that came up with the idea, but just reading through it, it it's really a description in this, whether it's a play or a drama uh, that he wrote, or, or it's literally a letter that he wrote to his beloved, the Shulamite, whether they're married or she was someone that was a part of his Harlem there. Um, we really don't know. It doesn't really say. It seems that he does marry her. Uh, who she was a gen Gentile, not a Jewish woman. Um, we see this relationship uh, between Solomon and this woman, and it's an uh, allegory of Christ and the church. A and you see subtle things in these chapters that kind of reference to that, that relationship with Christ and the church. You know, when you look at the cross and where Jesus hung on that cross, I mean, there's no doubt in our mind that he loved us. He loved us. For a human being to to sacrifice themselves for someone else, uh, you read stories of mothers sacrificing their lives for their children, or a father for their family, or or a soldier for our freedom here in the United States, you know, of America. And and you know that it's from love, right? You just know it. A uh, mother wouldn't die for their child unless they loved their child. And yet you hear have God Almighty come in the flesh and He goes to the cross to die for all of our wickedness, all of our sins. I mean, every evil thought and vile thing that we could think of and even do, He paid for it all on the cross. I mean, that's love. Even when we were His enemies, we were His enemies, we were against Him, we wanted nothing to do with Him. In fact, we weren't even seeking Him and yet He still died on the cross for us. I mean, that truly is love. And just from that point of reference creates such a great relationship with God. Now, I don't want to get into the deepness of our relationship with Christ and how deep it can get, and it can get pretty deep depending on you as an individual. You know, women are more sensitive to the Spirit than men. I, I, I believe that. But yet there are some men that... Uh, are very sensitive to the Spirit and the moving of the Spirit. And I think Pastor Chuck was one of those men. Uh, Brian Brodison is probably one of those men. Raul Reese is one of those men. Uh, sometimes he blows me away. He goes to a conference and he, sits, he gets up there and he starts crying and people start coming up to the Lord. <laughs> they just come up, I want to accept the Lord. And he's just crying because you know, he's just so sensitive to the lost soul and he wants to see that soul saved, and he'll say a few words and then just start bawling, and then be like, just come on up and receive the Lord, and they just start coming up because he's so sensitive to the Spirit. And so there's a sensitivity. We, we know of this relationship that we can have with God. I mean, it's clear. You, you look at the life of Christ in the Gospels, right? And, and you see how he created these relationships with these men, the twelve disciples and 120 other disciples, men and women included, and he had this relationship with them. It wasn't superficial. I mean, it was purely out of love, but the relationships that he had with each of these individuals and, and as a group of people 
was similar to the relationship that we have with one another. It's not really that different. You know, the time that we spend you know, here at this church, and I'm sure at other churches too, uh, how we pour our hearts into individuals that want to serve the Lord and want to fulfill their calling in various ministries and so forth. And so we equip them. And, and we have time where we set aside for just around ten guys and we just sit there and we talk about the ministry. And we pour our hearts into them and we pray for one another. We're there for one another. And that's what Jesus did with his disciples. And then we have a, a, another core group of, of a pastor's meeting where we have maybe four guys. And again, we're talking about the ministry you know, and the ins and outs of it, the nuts and bolts and the struggles and, and so forth, the responsibility of it all. And we pour into, into them. And then we have the church you know, and the various ministries. And, and we get together on Agape Feast Day and we're all eating together and, you know, and fellowshipping and talking about this and that and so forth. And we're creating relationships, right? It's part of the body of Christ. We're a family. And so it's really similar to what Jesus did with the disciples and 120 other disciples and even the crowds and so forth. And then there were times when he just blew them away you know, by miracles or signs or wonders or, or saying a few words and they, they were just like, what is he talking about? And then something happening, you know, uh, water that was just bolstering all over the place and it looked like the boat was going to sink, you know, and all of a sudden they're like, Jesus, don't you care? And then he just spoke the words and the sea calmed. I mean, that's deep. And that's a relationship to experience something like that with Jesus Christ, you know. I'm sure they're like, who is this guy, you know. And they said it many times. And we can still have that type of relationship. I've seen healings and many others have seen healings where, where we called on the name of Jesus, could you do something and the Lord has taken away the cancer or the back pain or or whatever sickness or illness. Prophecies, the gifts of the Spirit, that's when you start getting deeper in that relationship. These things that we can experience with God are there for all of us, and so much more. I don't think we can really fathom what God has for us until we begin to seek Him and seek Him with our whole heart, what He would want to do for us. We're still on this plane where, where, where we're dealing with our struggles. I'm just trying to get through my financial difficulties. I'm trying to get through my relationship. You know, and, and so you're stuck at that point, and, and you have to get beyond that point. God can take care of those things. You know when He takes care of those things? When, when you're at the deepest in life, where there's heartache and pain, and you're seeking God so deeply that He moves in your heart and that He takes care of all those things. Whether it's the way you think it should be taken care of or not, He takes care of it where you find unspeakable joy and unspeakable peace that you know that your God, my God, is in total control of your life. But it only comes by truly seeking Him. You know, we have church and, and we... It's been going on for you know, thousands of years, gathering together from, from the early church. Let's go to the upper room and wait for the Holy Spirit. And they sang hymns and psalms, Paul says, you know, in their presence and so forth. So church has been going on forever. And yet here we are today, and it's such a struggle, and I see it not just in this church, but I see it across a lot of churches, is that people are not interested in worshiping God. They come late. You know, they'll be a few minutes late or they're going doing other things that might be fun and exciting. And then they kind of sneak in real quick and then want to hear the Word of God and then they leave. You know, and that's really not a relationship with God. And that's not worshiping God. God deserves our utmost, doesn't He? I mean, He gave His utmost. And for us to give Him maybe 20 minutes of worship... And, and, and even some of us, and I see this in other churches too, you just watch and people are texting and people are looking around and stuff, and they're not worshiping God. You know, and, and again, my question is, and, and I'm being truthful right now, and hopefully I'm saying it in a loving way, you know, I'm hopefully, hopefully because God wants to have this relationship with you, I hope you caught that. And He has so much for you. But if you are not seeking Him really from your heart, He's not going to give it to you. You can't get it. You know, until you do. 
when you fully surrender everything to Him and you give Him your heart and you come here to say, Lord, I'm focused on You. I'm letting everything else go. I'm just going to worship You. I'm going to hear Your Word. I'm going to be instructed. I'm going to hear Your Spirit and I'm going to, going to be obedient to what You have asked me to do. And then you just grow. You experience Him in new ways. That's what this book is all about, our relationship with Christ and the church. We're the church. We are the bride. Even though we're men, that kind of sounds funny, like, you know, I'm a bride. Well, wait a minute, I'm a man. How can I be a bride? Well, in God's economy and the way He views things, I'm a bride to Him because I have this relationship with Him. And it's a neat relationship, an exciting relationship. Even in my sins, which I know displeases Him, but yet I know that He still loves me and that He's working out my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling, but He's working all things together for good in my life, you know, because He's the author and finisher of my faith. And I can trust in Him, just like in my earthly relationship with my wife. She sins all the time, and I still love her. No. <laughs> you know, I sin all the time, and she still loves me. And she's not going to leave me or forsake me because she's related to me now. She's stuck on me until we get to heaven. So we have that relationship with Christ and, and I hope that you really seek that relationship because there's so much more that uh, He wants to give you. Especially in these last days uh, when we need more of Him to get through life and what's going on in this world today. In chapters 5 and 8, the relationship between the husband and the wife and the power of their love is, is so visible here. Um, in chapter 8, verse 7, says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. And so love, love, love is, is really the key here. Let's go ahead and start with verse 1 in chapter 5, as we look at the married life. There's the word, the beloved. And so here's the, the groom, Solomon, speaking to his bride. I have come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. And then we have this remarks from his friends. Eat, O friends. Drink, yes, drink deeply, O oh, beloved one. And then the Shulamite says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. So you see this idea where the beloved is speaking, and the bride says, oh, I hear his voice. I hear his voice. He's speaking, you know, and, and she's excited about that. We should be excited about hearing the voice of God. Well, what does the voice of God sound like? It's right here in the Word of God. Where do I get my instructions? Right here in the Word of God. Where's the voice of God? Right here in the Word of God. Where does God direct me? Right here in the Word of God. Where does that relationship start? Right here in the Word of God. That's how we hear Him. That's how He speaks to us. And again, we need to be in the Word of God for Him to hear us. To hear us. And for us to hear Him. As she heard her Beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove. I like that, my dove. I've never heard that one before. I've, I've heard men say, honey, or women say, honey, but I've never heard a wife say, my dove. I don't think I'd like that. My dove, no. How about my man? There, that sounds better. My perfect, oh, there you go, my perfect one. That sounds good for ladies. I don't suggest you do that. Don't say my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them again? My feet have been washed, she says. You know, John Corson talks about this a little bit. He says, going to church both Sunday and morning and Wednesday night is just not good enough for the Lord. And we think it is. Well, I went Sunday. And I went Wednesday. What more do I need to do? That's religion. I was in a religious system where I went Sunday, and then come Monday I did what I wanted. A relationship with Christ is not about going to church and then doing what you want. A relationship with Christ is 
is a relationship that is every day with Christ. It, it's you are who you are in church and you are that outside of church. Nothing changes. You should be the same person. And if you're a different person in school than you are here, then something's wrong with your relationship. And you better, you better get right with the Lord because it should be the same as in church as it is outside of church. And I've taught that to my boys is that <clears throat> that we need to have the zeal and the excitement for God outside the church as much as inside the church. And if we have a zeal for other things, then something's wrong with our zeal for God. I think of the Super Bowl that just, just passed, and I didn't watch any of it at all. I warned you about some of the commercials, and some of you were already talking about some of the bad commercials on there uh, that they broadcast. I don't know if you saw them or not. <clears throat> I didn't see them. But I think about all the Christians that were so excited on that Super Bowl. I mean, I could see all the posts on Facebook, you know, and you could people talking about it, Denver, you know, and the whole bit, and screaming and yelling and so forth. And in my heart, I'm like, if I can't scream and yell for the Lord, if I can't raise my hands when I'm worshiping for the Lord, if I can't sing to Him openly, I'm not going to do it for the Denver Broncos. You know, shame on me. It's like, I would rather scream and shout for God, and then, if it's loud enough, then go and shout for the Denver and say, yeah, but you're a little less, because you're just humans, and we're enjoying your beating up on each other, and you know, and so forth, but, but God deserves praise and adoration and, and loud shouting definitely as we see in the Psalms. It's not just a Sunday and Wednesday thing. It is an everyday thing. You know, is your house filled with the Lord? We have uh, our Bowles radio. We have several of them and we run them 24 hours a day on K-Wave. And so there's teaching going on or there's music going on and it's just all day long. And we're listening. Sometimes all of a sudden something catches our ear and we're, okay, Lord, what are you saying? It just caught our ear. Or there's music and we're singing praise songs as we're doing whatever it is that we're doing it for that day. Filling your house, filling your lives with the Lord every day is church day with the Lord. How often does the Lord call us, but we say, as soon as the ninth inning is over, maybe I'll spend some time with you. Or as soon as I get done with this, here, then I'll come over there. You know. And God wants to pour into us, and we miss the opportunities. You know, some people actually carry around with them a, a notepad and a pencil, and as they're going out through the day, the Lord speaks to them, and they write something down, the Scripture verse and what the Lord said. And then at the end of the day, they'll review and, and see what God has been saying to them. I remember uh, encountering someone like that. We were somewhere, and then all of a sudden they said, stop, wait a minute, i got to write this down real quick. And they pulled out a pad and they ran this down. I'm like, what are you doing? Writing the scripture. The Lord just gave me something real quick. You know, I use my phone, and he'll give me something, so I've got a little note, you know, the little note pad that you have on there, and I'll write it down real quick if he gives me something. And I need to remember it. Because I find that if I don't, and then all of a sudden later on in the day, I go, what was that that he gave me? Oh, I forgot. I can't remember. It was something, Lord, Scripture. Oh, and then it's like, forget it. It's lost. You know, and I'll never get it back. You know, so, so taking that time to really listen to Him all day long. <clears throat> That's what a bride does to the groom. Always attentive and listening. But she missed the moment. He's speaking. And she's like, oh, you know what? I've already been out there. I took my coat off. My feet will get dirty again. I, I can't go. You know, maybe next time. Don't miss out. My beloved put, my beloved, verse uh, 4, my beloved put his hand by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for him. Mm. We need to yearn for the Lord. I arose to open for my beloved and my hand dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh and on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke, I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. And keepers of the wall took my veil away from me. We go through persecution. You know, if we're in rebellion against the Lord, if we're not seeking him, and we know we should be, 
and, and all of a sudden we get this idea that we need him now, we start seeking him, we get beat up. The world will beat us up without the Lord. And we really need to repent and come back to the Lord in that proper relationship that he wants to have with us. But the world is cruel and wicked and they have no mercy. They don't care about us. After the debate, uh, Ken Ham has got his Facebook and you could post your, your comments on there. And he has it open so that you can post your comments on there. Well, he had to turn the security off of that and stop receiving posts because he was getting so much vulgar garbage from atheists that he didn't want to offend his supporters. I mean, they were just using profanity and all of this stuff against him. It's like, how sad. The world doesn't care. They'll just put it right out there in front of your face and let everybody see it. You know, speak out loud. You know, just tell it the way it is, the way I feel. It's on my heart. It must be true. You know, and you get beat up. The best place to be is just right there with the Lord and don't lose that relationship. I charge you, O daughter of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am lovesick. Then the daughters of Jerusalem, what is your, what is your beloved more than another beloved, O Ferris, among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? And then the Shulamite, the bride, says, My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among ten thousand. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. Now this speaks of his deity, Christ's deity, his purity, superiority, but also his divinity. Jesus is God. It's clear in John 10.30. He said, I and the Father are one. Colossians 2.9, Paul said, In Him that is dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. And then 1 Timothy 3.16, which I love, it says, God was manifested in the flesh. Speaking of Jesus Christ. His eyes are like doves by the river of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with barley. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on base of fine gold. His countenance, that is his, his face and his features, is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most, is most sweet, yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. He's altogether lovely. We have a song that uh, we sing that, right? He's altogether lovely. Is he lovely in your life? Is he lovely in your life? You know, when I first got saved, just the name Jesus would cause me to break down. And then when these songs started coming out, just with the name Jesus, you know, just Jesus, Jesus, it's just like, oh, just singing the name Jesus, and you just know that he is just so lovely. It just breaks you down just to hear his name. In fact, I, I remember the first time I heard and I'm sure I probably heard it before, but uh, heard of someone having the name Jesus, which is Jesus. And I'm like, that just ruined it for me. <laughs> the name doesn't have the same meaning to, for me now, you know, when someone else has the name Jesus. But Jesus' name, the name above all names, the name at which every knee will bow before him and confess him as Lord, his name is awesome. It's altogether lovely. Chapter 6. Now the daughters of Jerusalem say, Where has your beloved gone, O Ferris, among women? Where has your beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with you? Then the woman says, the Shulamite, My beloved has gone to his garden, to the bed of spices, to feed his flock in the, gar in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. And then, the beloved, that is Samuel, says, Oh, my love, you are beautiful as Tarzah, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. That's an interesting phrase there. It's interesting because if, when you go to Proverbs, uh, Solomon talks about the, the woman. And you notice that, in the, I don't know if you read the book of Proverbs, but he talks about the strange woman, the seductive woman, and not to be lured by her 
her ways. Well, he talks about this, how her eyes will lure you away. It's interesting because he's talking about Gentile women in Proverbs. And how you need to be careful as Jewish men not to be lured away by the Gentiles. Stick with your own kind that is Jewish. And he's giving this great wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And yet here he falls for this woman and says, boy, your eyes just, ooh, they melt me. You look at me and I'm just like, oh, tell me what to do and I'll do it. You know, I'm just so melted by you completely. You know, that's love. Now, it could be lust in, in his eyes because we know that he had a lot of women. A lot of women. It, it, he tried everything under the sun, he said. And had a lot of money to do it with and so forth. And we know at the end of, uh, what was it, uh, Ecclesiastes, when we read it and went through it, at the end he says, you know what, all this is vanity. It, 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 I've tried it all and it doesn't bring happiness, doesn't bring peace. And what brings peace is to be obedient to the Lord. That's what brings real peace. And yet, with that great wisdom, he struggled with being obedient to God's word and obedient to wisdom. You know, you can have wisdom, but if you don't apply it, it doesn't do anything for you. It really doesn't. You have to apply that wisdom to your life. So, I mean, she just melted him you know, with, with her eyes. And so he goes on and says, Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Your hair is like the flock of goats uh, going down from Gilead. So she had goat's hair. Your teeth are like the flock of sheep. So she had sheep teeth, which, <laughs> which have come up from the washing Everyone bears twins, and none is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veil. So she had pomegranate, huge temples popping out of the side of her head. And there were 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one. In other words, she was the best, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the ones who bore her, the daughter saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines all praised her. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as the army, the banner? Now he's talking about the church, right? I mean, you, you see, that at that time I'm sure it was very lovely to say things like that. You know, oh, your teeth are so white, they're like goat's teeth. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, they, they melted. Oh, boy, did you hear what he said about my teeth? You know, did you hear what he said about my hair? It's like goat hair. You know, and the goats are running around, you know, the whole bit. Or goats don't do bad. That's sheep. You know, um, I'm sure it was great back then. But the diversity of the church itself, because he's speaking about the church, right? And this is the description that Jesus has for the church, the diversity of the churches and uh, the variety of people that are involved in it. And it's just amazing how he can have a relationship with all of them. And, and how he does that is how? Because he dwells within us, right? When we ask him into our hearts, he comes into our hearts, fills us with the Holy Spirit. And now we have this personal relationship with God ourselves that we can um, experience with God in, in all kinds of different ways. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome in the army banners? Then she says... I went down to the garden of nuts to see uh, the vendor of the valley, to see whether the vine had uh, bubbled or budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. Before I was even aware, my soul had made me as the chariots of a noble people. And then the beloved's friends said, Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. And she says, what would you see in Shulamite, as it were, the dance of the two camps? What would you see in the Shulamite? I mean, what's in us to even see as a church? I mean, what good is there in us? There is no good in us, right? There are none righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. Deuteronomy says that. Paul says that in Romans. Uh, our righteousness are like filthy rags. Our hearts are deceitful and wicked. Who can even know it? So what is good in us? Christ in us, that's what's good. And when we do good with Christ in us, then those are received as good because of the righteousness that's been imputed to us by Christ. He put it into our account. And so when God sees us, He sees Christ. And so when He sees us, He sees a perfect, pure and holy and arrayed in white robes church. 
and you're beautiful in His sight. Though you're not there yet, but spiritually you already sit in the heavenlies, and God sees you that way. So our esteem comes from Christ. We're valued because of His values and what He values, but not based upon the world, not based upon what we think is valuable or not. It's based upon what God says is valuable. And His creation is valuable. That is us, His creation. So He values us, not for our works or not for our righteous acts, but because we have humbled ourselves, received Christ into our hearts, taking upon ourselves His righteousness, and thus responding to that by doing good works. And God receives the good works. And then He rewards us for it too. But in us, there's really nothing in our own flesh. That's a hard balance to get, really, isn't it? I mean, because we don't want to think of ourselves as being bad people, right? Well, I'm not too bad, and I hear that all the time. My son's not a bad kid. You know, I, so many times I want to say, yes, he is. He's wicked. You don't know what he does when you're not around, you know, because I know I was a kid one time. But I can't say that because they're like, no, you don't know, you don't know him. You know, he's a good kid. You know, he's good at heart. That's not what the Bible says. His heart is deceitful and wicked. Now, in Christ, He's everything, and He's good. And that's the view we need to have. Otherwise, it's distorted. And we have to understand that. Otherwise, our Christian worldview is wrong. And we have the worldview that man is inherently good, right? And we are capable of doing good. And we're not. We're not at all without Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Next chapter. How beautiful are the feet in sandals, O oh, prince, princess daughter, the curves of your thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a skillful woman. So here the king compliments his bride upon the beauty of her feet, you know, which is interesting. <laughs> feet weren't necessarily or are necessarily a beautiful part of your body, but I mean, guess some people have beautiful feet. I don't know of any, but um, in this case she must have had beautiful feet. Uh, talks about Ephesians 15, having shotted your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, God has, has given us the peace of God. Your navel <clears throat> is a round goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. Your wrist is a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like the ivory tower. Your eyes are like the pool's in Hishbon by the gates of Bath Rabin. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looks towards Damascus. So I guess it's like long and then crooked. I don't know. Solomon built those towers, and so for him, you know, it's a reference of, you know, he, here, in a sense, he's, what he's saying here is that, you know, I built these towers, and because I built them, I created them. They're beautiful, and so I created you. You know, and you're beautiful in my sight, whether you have a big nose or not. I, I don't like big noses. I know I have one. Don't don't tell me or remind me. I like small noses. That's why I like my wife because she has a small nose. I think Michael Jackson had the best nose after all that surgery. He had the best nose ever. You know, he got it just right with a little bit of the lift, you know, and the crease on the top, so it just looked like a little oinker, you know. <laughs> I think white noses are probably the best noses, especially if they come from Sweden or Denmark, you know, somewhere in that area. <laughs> but not the long towers. <clears throat> your head crowns you like Mount Carmel, and the hair of your head is like purple. You know, we do that today. The girls color their hair is purple now. You know, my wife will put pink in her hair every once in a while. Uh, they did it back then. The king is held captive by your uh, treases. How fair and how pleasant you are, O oh love, with your delights. The statue of, you, of yours is like the palm tree, and your breasts like its clusters. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. <clears throat> Let now your breasts be like clusters of the vine. I'm, I'm stumbling over this part. The fragrance of your breath like apples, and the roof of your mouth like the best wine. Then she says, the wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. I am my beloved's, and his desire is towards me. Related to Christ. 
Christ's desire is for you. You know, we don't seek God. It's God who seeks us. I wasn't seeking God at all. God sought me out. And how many times has someone had to bring a friend to church in order for them to meet God? You, know? you have to bring people because they don't meet God on their own. They don't decide one day, I want to go meet God. You know, No, there's a chain of events that God brings in their lives to get them to a point where they say, what is going on in my life? God, you need to help me or reveal yourself to me. And, you know, and all of a sudden, there they are. They see God. And God shows himself to him. It's Christ who desires you. You know, there's some Christian teachers, and I'm sad to say, who teach that we should make demands of God. You know, we're the children of God, and we're like God, and so we can demand God to do things. He's a, he's a genie in the bottle. And we just rub it the right way, God will do what we want Him to do. And that's far from the truth. God isn't that way at all. We're His servants. We're to serve Him. Uh, like she says here, I am my beloved. I am my beloved. I am His. You know, what do you want me to do? Not, will you do this? And we get that idea. I mean, I remember you know, hearing of children saying, well, I didn't ask to be born into this family. They're the ones that had me, so they need to support me. You know, That's not what He's saying here. You, know, you are my parents. I am your child. And so with that comes a certain responsibility. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine has budded, whether the grapes blossomed, are open, blossoms are open, and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. So out there in the vineyard, as husband and wife, the mandrakes, which we know mandrakes were a fruit that actually would bring fertility, you get pregnant with uh, Jacob's um, wives. He, they would take the mandrakes and hoping that they have children. Of course, then they have the twelve boys, you know, and then the twelve tribes of Israel. So here they are. The mandrakes uh, give off a fragrance, uh, and at our gate, which makes sense, you know, you go back to Jacob, you read that whole story, and there's a whole whole thing how they were seeking out the mandrakes so that they could have children. And now apparently, it brings out a fragrance, which then brings about the arousal for one another. And at our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner, new and old, which I have laid up for my beloved. You get this idea in, in this play or drama or whatever it is, this song that he wrote with the different parts and sections of people coming in and out you know, as, as they're bringing this all about, you know, that the bride is really preparing herself for him, right? I mean, she's just in love with him and is preparing himself for him, uh, doing whatever it takes from coloring her hair, you know, to, to beautifying her nose, you know, and keeping her teeth white and stuff like that. I mean, that's how it should be in our relationships with husbands and wives. You know, our wives should be preparing themselves for you know, their husband. Uh, a lady came up to me a couple weeks ago. And she was like, I agree with you 100%. I agree with you 100%. My husband would get so mad because I would put on makeup and I'd get all dressed up and he'd get mad at me. And he'd say, why are you getting all dressed up? And I'm like, for you. For you. No, it's not for me. You know, he got jealous, you know. Um, and there are men like that. But if she's getting dressed up and beautified for you, man, take advantage of it, I say. You know, I mean, she's doing it for you because she loves you. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's finish up this chapter. Chapter 8. Oh, that you were like my brother. Now, this is a little weird, but I'll, I'll explain it in a minute. If you were like, oh, that you, if you were like my brother, who nursed at my mother's breast, if I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. I would lay, I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to instruct me. I would cause you to drink of spices, spiced wine and of juice of my pomegranate. Um, to kiss publicly was really frowned upon. Your wife, you know, you just didn't do that publicly. It was the culture. But you could kiss a relative. You know, you, if you had your mother there, you give your mom a kiss, your dad a kiss, or your brother or your sister and so forth. But not your husband. You just don't do that. 
and so forth. So what she's saying here is, if you were only like my brother, I'd give you big kisses, you know. Uh, right now, in front of everybody, I wouldn't be ashamed of it. It would be like kissing my brother. And then the daughters of Jerusalem say in verse 3, His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And then a relative, we don't know who it is, says, Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. And then the Shulamite to her beloved, that is Solomon, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arms. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flaming of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love nor can the flood drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despaired. This is God's love for us, but is that our love for God? Our love doesn't matter. What matters is His love. Oftentimes we talk a lot about how much we love God, how much we sacrifice for God, how much we do for God, how much we give to God, and really that doesn't matter. What we really need to look at is how much He's going to give to us. What He sacrificed for us. The God who is the creator of the heaven and earth would come down, become a man, and die on the cross in our place. That is amazing. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I want to just share this with you real quick. You probably know it, but I mean, God loves you so much. And if anything tonight, if, if you remember anything, remember this, that He loves you more than you could even imagine. Even in your sin, he loves you. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these, to these things? If God is for us, who can stand against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. So there's no condemnation. And furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, swords, as it is written? For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life Angels, principalities, powers, things present or things come, heights, death, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Talk about loving. God loves us, and nothing will ever separate that love from you. He loves you just the way you are. He wants you to come to Him just the way you are, and then He'll clean you up. He'll clean you up. He'll take care of all the rest. But just know that, that He loves you. And nothing you do, nothing anyone else does, nothing that Satan could ever say or accuse you of will ever separate that love that He has for you. You are precious. You're the apple of His eye. And He loves you that much. The Shulamite brother says, We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall... We will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Then the Shulamite says, I am a wall, my breasts like towers. When I become in his eyes, or when I became in his eyes as one who found peace, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. And that's where one of the Sections just seem to change from her speaking. And then Solomon says, My own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who tend its fruits, two hundred. Then she says, You who dwell in the gardens, the, the companions listen for your voice. Let me hear it. The Shulamite says, Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. 
strange ending. You know, he really doesn't say much there, but I think that when you look at Solomon and how he came about, and you can realize that, that this song of songs was the best song that he has ever written of all the wisdom of books you know, that we have in the Pentateuch and in, you know, obviously Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, you know, and then the Song of Solomon's, uh, how he ends it here. And so it could be that it was, it was a play or a letter to his beloved, but it seemed like people had parts and they were shouting out back and forth to one another. And then it ends, so... How God loves you. That's pretty amazing. The Song of Solomon, I think, gives us the best description of how much God loves us. Besides Romans chapter 8, 31 on. That, that that love could never be taken away from you. But the details that he writes in the Song of Solomon are, are amazing of the love that Christ has for us. We can't doubt ourselves. Don't ever say that God doesn't love you. Or that he stopped loving you. Just look at the cross. And let it remind you that he will always love you until the end.